happening right now. Let's talk about day two of lockdown and the furlough scheme. Uh, details announced by the Chancellor of Issue Senate yesterday. £25 billion pounds, uh, new uh, scheme uh, to, uh, well, keep people in their jobs. The multi-billion pound extension of the government's 80% furlough scheme is lasting till March, he says, as he warned of a difficult winter ahead. But um, is it going to cut it? Well, let's talk to Miata Fanbula. She's the chief executive of the New Economics Foundation, the left-wing think tank. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, again, yet more largesse being handed out, huge sums of money uh, being handed out. Um, uh, is this going to be enough to save jobs and save businesses, though? Well, look, I think his decision to extend the furlough scheme and extend it for enough time for businesses to plan whilst we're still in the eye of this awful pandemic was completely right. Uh, he should have done this months ago. Um, and the fact that he didn't do this months ago means that many jobs have been lost. But we know from the last you know, few months, uh, through the lockdown and out, that the furlough scheme has been an absolute lifeline because it's allowed businesses that hang, to hang on that are generally struggling, but critically, it's allowed them to keep people in the labour market. And I can't emphasise enough, the cost of mass unemployment, the scarring of mass unemployment, will be far more costly in the long term for our economy, for our taxpayers, than acting decisively now to mitigate that outcome. And indeed, this has been something that uh, many think tanks on the left and the right and, and the uh, the independents have been pointing out, that the cost is huge ever since March. The cost is absolutely huge of all that help that's been extended to self-employed, employed and businesses, grants, everything. But it is a drop in the ocean, realistically, compared to the long term cost of allowing all those businesses businesses to go under uh, and and all, all those those jobs to disappear. Um, I suppose a lot of people, the big question mark yesterday is, why do we need a furlough scheme till the end of March when we've only got a lockdown lasting till the 2nd of December? The big fear here is we come out of lockdown, uh, that, that legislation automatically falls on the 2nd of December, and we go into tier three, tier two, most of the country, and that is still going to have a massive impact on a lot of their businesses in retail, uh, in the leisure industry, in hospitality. Um, is it is it though many people are asking it is it is it is it viable to effectively keep those preserve those businesses in aspect for yet another three four five months well no and you know most business sources will say we have already drawn down huge amounts of reserves uh, we are already hanging on um, and this is a massive blow and i don't think we can underestimate that or downplay it um, and, you know, in an ideal world, of course, who wants to be going in and out of lockdown? It's hugely damaging. This was the outcome that we were all, you know, in the first lockdown, we said we've got to avoid a second wave. We've got to avoid a second lockdown because the double hit on the economy will be absolutely huge. The critical ingredient in all of this, because in truth, you know, this virus hasn't gone away. It's not about to go away anytime soon. Even when a vaccine does, you know, come into train, it's going to take a long time to roll it out across the population until we have herd immunity. So we've got to find a way of coexisting with this virus. And the way that we do that is to have a really effective test and trace system that allows us to kind of manage it okay. at the same time as willing to take some decisive uh -huh. local action to clamp down. I hate to, tell you, I hate to tell you Germany had a really effective test and trace system and they've just locked down. I'm not entirely sure that people who think that is the big answer and the magic spell uh, are actually uh, living in the real world. Let's look, look, well, neither, well, neither, well, neither you nor well, I, let, wait, wait, Miata, 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 neither you nor I is an expert in, in medics. But, can we, can we talk about... They're only locked down, but at much, much lower rates of transmission. So they're locking down now in order not to have the sort of spike that we have, which means that after the four weeks, there's a big risk that we wouldn't have controlled the virus. They have acted quickly and decisively. In other parts of Asia, earlier on in the year, we saw a second wave. So we know the virus can spike, but when you act quickly, you suppress it. And then you can open up again, which is what they've managed to do. So, of course, this thing is with us. The key question is you have to have every single medical expert says you've got to have test and trace. That's not particularly revolutionary information. But the critical part for me is because we're in going to be in and out of this thing, you've got to provide commensurate economic support, okay. which is what the chance is doing too late. But there are many that are falling through the cracks of this scheme. There are many who are already unemployed. And the truth is our social security system is wholly inadequate to deal with the second phase of this thing. So he's got to look alongside furlough to bolster social security. We think we should be having a minimum income protection of about 220 pounds a week 
for anyone that needs it for the next six months so we don't compound this awful thing with mass hardship across and, the country. And this is the issue, is getting the people who've fallen through some of the self-employed, three million self-employed, never been entitled to anything because they didn't have accounts that they could they could put forward. Um, and, uh, and of course, we have the lowest among them in the Western world, among the lowest uh, basic income, don't we, in terms of uh, universal credit, you're, what you're basically entitled to unemployed in, 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 in the Western world. You're saying that that needs to go up, I'm assuming not just for the short term, but for the long term, and that that will make a difference. But um, the, the trouble with this is, again, we are piling up huge amounts of debt. Uh, this has all got to be paid for by taxpayers eventually. Um, the the decades, and it is going to be decades it's going to take to pay back, is going to have a massive impact on people's lives forever. Even if they get another job, they rebuild their business, the sort of taxes that are going to have to be paid is going to be a stranglehold on a lot of those people. Well, look, no one can dispute that this is costly. Um, you know, wars, pandemics, they're costly. Uh, but you, for me, it's not really a viable option not yep. to spend. Well, every reputable organisation, the IMF, the OECD, are all saying to governments globally, you've got to step in, you've got to bolster your economy. The key piece in this, so if we think about ways in which countries have effectively paid down their deficit, is by getting their economies to rebound and rebound strongly. Uh, and so you invest now to create the basis by which your economy can bounce back in a big way um, and that allows you to bring in revenue and draw and pull down your deficit that is the key ingredient and to be honest if we look historically that's been far more effective than for example cuts um, I think that we're going to also have to combine it with taxation, but there's a way in which we can tax it in a way that is as progressive as possible. But it doesn't feel like there's another alternative, because in the end, all of this is costly. Not acting is costly. Okay. Uh, so the key question is act act in a way that bolsters your economy, but that allows you to build back in a way that will allow you to pay down your debt and hopefully have a better social settlement on the other side. Okay.